So in the last video, um, we covered the technological doom of the soul pretty thoroughly. Um, there's a great deal uh, that could be said about it. And I could do whole videos on it about the destructive nature of technology, how it erodes the soul. Anyway, that's something debatable. Um, and that happens to be a great debate of our time. It's as you know, are we playing God and going in the wrong direction with it? Some people feel like we're just playing God. Some people feel like it's not our place to play God. Some feel like it is our place as long as we're responsible. And then some people feel like it's our place to pl not only play God, but to go all the way with it and create everything that is possible, even if it destroys us in the process. <laughs> and that is a whole other topic because those folks are ruled by some powers that are strange and of strange origin. They are of true alien origin. And I mean alien in that they serve no organic purpose in this system. They're not here for the homeostasis of this system or for us or for our planet or our bodies. But I'll cover that another time. In this video, I wanted to cover the salvation of the natural soul. The golden calf, as I mentioned before, uh, re it represents the resurrection of this planet. Um, it's a living, breathing organism with a consciousness that holds a frequency. And those foreign to it will find themselves beset with woe by its antibodies. It creates a natural polarity between they and the planet itself. That we attune ourselves to it when we're born as children of Gaia. There's the Schumann resonance, and I know many people know about it. It's the natural biological, it's the frequency that governs all the circadian rhythms and all the life cycles of this planet. And we're tied directly into it. We're supposed to be able to feed from it. Uh, and one of the timelines um, is the one where we attune ourselves to choose the timeline of the resurrection of this planet. The mystics um, of the Bible described a virgin who is required to have oil prepared for her lamp or her vessel at the time of the imminent arrival of her bridegroom. So when she is prepared, she's ready for him and all is glorious power. And there's deep symbology in this parable because of the preparation needed for this lamp. Because we do the work of preparing our own lamp as vessels for light. But the planet has a lamp as well. And we as stewards of this planet are responsible for preparing hers as we are responsible for tending to the planet and, and for tending to our own bodies. Um, it's a symbiotic relationship. And if we don't tend to her, we may lose the privilege of living with her. There have had to be the creation of new soul groups and new, what do they call them, root races to start over when we don't get it right and we experience an extinction level event Sometimes there are higher powers that need to come in and, uh, and reseed this place. But back to these brides, these, these, uh, these virgins. Uh, it's the parable of the bridesmaids. You know, so in the parable of the bridesmaids, there's this talk of ten bridesmaids who are to carry oil for their vessels because they are torchbearers for the bridegroom. And he arrives in the middle of the night with little warning. So when the solar flash arrives, it will arrive as the Lord in this parable. So our, our vessels are our bodies, and any vessel is considered feminine in the occult when it is to act as a container. And as a container for light or electricity, it is considered feminine in that it is receptive to the will of light. Uh, and we're to prepare ourselves as vessels as we prepare the mother. When I say the mother, um, you know, remember, I'm talking about the planet, the goddess, or the feminine aspect of creation, which takes shape in many different ways. Uh, it's about energy and a receptive state acting as a container or as a womb where potentials are able to play out through, like a, a magnetic field um, or a hermetic field or vacuum. So we're also, there's a part of us that's created in her image. Now remember the phrase, after our image and our likeness, that was the phrase in the Bible they used. 
that we were created. It said, let us create them after our image and our likeness. And this was the Elohim talking. See, these days we hear about the Elohim being a race of beings. And in a sense, they are. It's elevated light consciousness. It's the consciousness of light, which takes the construct of, um, when I say the construct, it, it constructs itself many different ways to accomplish purpose in different ways, to accomplish its purpose in different ways. It accomplishes its, its purpose by creating these geometric patterns that are filled with the power of the elements to play out the purpose of light. And we, in the way we are built, have a modicum of free will because we have the power to allow the elements to act freely through us and we can transmute the elements. We can serve as superconductors. We, you know, through our desire, our creativity, our passion, we can rise the power of fire. We can create and build with the power of earth. We can expand the power of the mind, consciousness, which is air. And we can use, uh, utilize the power of emotions to, um, to accomplish uh, beautiful things, to give birth to new life, and to reveal secrets in matter that are only achievable through its liquid state. Now, what's also key in this parable is the number 10. The 10 is symbolic of completion of a cycle, they say, but it's also symbolic of a microcosm and a macrocosm, because 10 is also one. So, as bridesmaids, they're expectant, or there is this expectant marriage of a powerful either solar force or a lordly force, which is to be contained within their form. The oil catches the flame and allows it to burn. Which makes me believe that this oil, uh, this parable is referencing the ormus, or the state of gold in a colloidal form, in a liquid state. Uh, in a liquid state, as a, or as a colloid, you know, the magnetic um, properties of gold and what it represents is, as fire, it's water and fire together. So when you ingest it, your body takes on the qualities of water and fire in a golden state, um, but also of earth and air for other reasons. And I'll go into that later. You know, and that's when it's mixed with the uh, white powder monoatomic gold. But, you know, I recall in a passage in the book of Exodus, it talked about Moses boiling down the golden calf and giving it to the Israelites to drink because it has the, um, there's something about it, I believe, that may sustain the form or sustain the body. Um, it may charge the body. It may allow the body to take on uh, food from the ether. So I don't know. But I know there should be a symbiotic relationship with us and the planet. And if we and the planet are both prepared with this gold the way we're supposed to, there may be a greater response between us and the planet when we need to take nourishment or when there's something from the planet that we uh, should be able to draw from the planet. We should be able to draw sustenance from the planet in ways that are energetic in nature and not just based on physical sustenance we should have to actually ingest very little very little physical sustenance to keep our bodies going but the things that we're capable of energetically where our cells functioning the way they're supposed to be we'd be like divine creatures you know they talk about the mitochondria and their electrical potential or the potential of the brain to generate magnetic fields or the heart to generate a magnetic field or the root, you know, the, your sexual energy, uh, the things we could create with our force, were we able to harness that force? And gold represents, it's sort of like, not the crutch, but it's the way, it's the vessel. It's, it's, the, it's what God has prepared for us to take on this divinity, to take on this perfection of force and form. Like I said, gold is sort of like alchemical divine fire. Uh, or divine fire or inspiration captured within a form. It's like divine force captured within math or shape, like the golden mean that gives the perfect angular momentum uh, for a torsion field uh, or for torsion of force. It's literally uh, the trinity in an elemental form, if that makes any sense. I don't know if I'm making sense, but it's like the perfection of both force and form. 
And in one form, like the white powder monoatomic gold, it represents earth and air. And as a colloid, it's like water and fire. But then, you know, it's an idea, gold. So it represents a trinity. And as a trinity, you see it in the delta. You see it in the 369 code of Tesla's toroidal math and in the rodent's coil. You see it in the rainbow at the fusion of red, yellow, and blue. You see it in the zodiac uh, at Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius. You notice what it does when a tetrahedron is created and you measure the energetic signatures at its vertices. You could think of perfection being like a living flame but captured in time where it's burning none of its heat. It isn't playing itself out. It never goes out. Perhaps that heat's channeled inwardly toward its form to sustain itself. That is the idea of perfection or the perfection of force and form. It's like the perfect balance of power that is capable of sustaining itself eternally. And that is the nature of gold. It doesn't relinquish its perfection. It never rusts. You know, and in its earth-air form, it can't be magnetically drawn and it holds heat and information like perfectly. The earth and air would be anything from like a physical brick to the white powder. But you might think of the amount of heat, though, that it takes to disintegrate gold. Fire purifies. So that's gold, which is perfection, purified by a purifying intense heat. <laughs> so that is some pretty potent stuff. And that's the white powder monoatomic gold. But in its colloidal state, it takes on the qualities of water and fire. So you have all the elements together, the quadruplicity. And that's like combining the elements, the first four elements, or the quadruplicity being the, the it is the, the four elements. And in the zodiac, you see the elements play out as fire, earth, air, water. And then it repeats that pattern over and over and over again. It begins with fire, Aries, the beginning of force, um, earth, Taurus, the toroidal field, the magnetic hyperboloid, uh, Gemini, air, the dielectric field or the dielectric nature of electricity or of a magnetic field, and water, the homeostasis, the, st the stabilizing of those four elements, creating uh, a rib, the 90 degree angle, the rib of atom that gives the elements its stability. And then water holds a special quality that allows things to mix and congeal together. It's really the only one element that's permitting of all of the others in that it will yield to them if their force is great enough. So as the quadruplicity, you have all four elements that have come together. And in the occult, they understand that when the four elements are combined, it creates a matrix. It creates a body or a field of creation where new creative potentials can be played out through. So that's the quadruplicity. It's when the logic of the patterns of creation are complete. When there can be established from a form, you know, a logical path or pattern of creation or for light or elements to play themselves out through. It's a body that is capable of utilizing within its form, its space to play out all of the elements through for the purpose of creation. I wonder if that makes more sense. So once this happens, this creation is marked by the position of Leo, which comes after Cancer, the fourth house. Leo is the fifth house, represents quintessence. And quintessence is the idea of creation, of creative force coming through by way of passion and joy and love and lordly, godly power. It's the force or the fire of life. And you've been hearing me talk about it all the time. It represents the Lion of Judah. Gold is God in mineral presence and is the nature of both the Son, our physical Son, and of the Messiah, God's microcosm, the collective Son of Man, um, or our internal Son. By adding it to the atmosphere, it captures the electrodynamic power of the Sun in the golden hue of Earth's magnetic torus. And it does wonders. It wakes things up. It increases the potential of light to create with, to create 
in and of itself to realize itself, to become more self-aware and become more aware of its creative potential. And by proximity, all things that are of light become aware of their creative potential. So when the Lord of judgment arrives, we're to have the planet prepared, like the parable of the bridesmaids. And, you know, me, when I mentioned the, the number 10, marking the microcosm and the macrocosm, uh, the microcosm being the individual person, the macrocosm being the collective body of people, which extends beyond, um, beyond us, beyond our community, beyond our family, beyond every body that we associate with. It is every body we associate with. Every body we associate with is marked by the number 10 um, because that is the division of the cycle or the division of the force that exists between, or the polarity that exists between us and, you know, the body that we consider as a, an extension of our ego, like a superego. And we have multiple superegos. We have multiple collective bodies. It's become all too convoluted. We have, you know, our nuclear family. We have our community. We have our churches. We have our political ties. We have our our uh, social groups, you know, and there are no end to the number of those. And we have all of these isms we identify with. And in the end, we're really just supposed to have us and God and the planet and our human family. But the number 10 is supposed to be marked by the collective of the body of individuals. So 10 bridesmaids not only refers to the individual being the number one, but it also refers to the nations. It refers to the planet. It's all of us. And by synchronicity, those attracted to this timeline will be those who they'll become an outer reflection of the internal spiritual work they've done on themselves, learning to give up judgment, learning to be charitable, learning pain and loss and grief. And they'll be made, remade as, as virgins. They'll have reclaimed their innocence, ready to receive his power within their vessels, prepared with the oil. And I realize this seems all over the place. It's just a deeper look into the scriptures because you hear about these parables and it doesn't really explain much. Um, they've never really given us many satisfying explanations for the majority of these parables, but I tell you, they can all be linked. And it's based on the understanding that we are to be prepared. You know, they talk about the temple of God being within you. They talk about when you see the image of the Messiah, you see the image of God. And that not only refers to the microcosm and macrocosm, concept of our holding the same sonic geometry as the heavens, but also we obey the same nature of light. Our behavior is of light. All of our archetypes are based on the nature of light and the many hues it's capable of producing, the whole spectrum. And there's a way to balance that through the use of gold. This is why Adam was taught about it in the very beginning. It was critical to his maintaining his divine state. So when the solar flash comes, you know, the end of this cycle, or when these earth changes culminate to something, to this critical mass where um, it marks the absolute separation of timelines, those who are prepared will move along uh, you know, with the timeline where we've adorned the world uh, with her golden magnetic Taurus. We've prepared the planet to make her ready to receive the flame, um, adorned with the magnetic Taurus altering properties of gold. And we should probably need to maintain um, this gold within our own bodies as well. And I feel like this is the essence of the true rapture. If something happens with us when we take on plasma, pure plasma with this gold within us. And there are experiments that have been conducted to prove this. You know, the NASA space shuttle, the one where they, you know, there's this whole debate about whether we went to the moon or not. It turns out, and through uh, the work of suspicious observers, they um, discovered through some declassified documents that uh, we did actually make it through the Van Allen, Van Allen belt 
and there was a big mystery of how we were supposed to be able to make it through this Van Allen belt, why the, the, the astronauts didn't cook. And that was supposed to be one of the smoking gun factoids about why the, the, the moon landing could not have taken place. When in fact, it actually did. And in these declassified CIA documents, it turns out uh, they not only made it to the moon, but they found evidence on the moon that periodically it sustains um, a catastrophic blast of the sun's plasma. And it's all across the back of the moon. And that may be why it holds a strange magnetic state, because it's crystallized. It's turned into a form of glass. And so they found evidence that the sun, uh, you know, it, it, it does uh, blast out. It, it, it creates this micronova, this ejecta that sends out that, like, it resets things. But they also discovered that the, the space shuttle was outfitted with a very interesting use of gold uh, I think shaped, so they said, uh, in a, like a, as a torus, I can't remember how they phrased it, but there was a, there was a, there was wording concerning gold, the use of gold, and a torus, the shape of something, but it created the effect on the shuttle where the bow shock blasted away most of the radiation. Um, it changed the state of the radiation, so somebody really knows what they're doing. They understand the use, the occult use of this stuff, the occult properties of it. And it's, it's these, these really old fraternities, these brotherhoods, and they really want to keep power divided between their two factions. I'm here really to spill the beans about it all and to give the power back to people. So they're no longer governed by, you know, two almighty factions volleying power back and forth at the turn of each age. Uh, in the golden state, there's no need for all that because we have the connection with the planet and our own personal connection with God. We don't need people to tell us how to worship God. God is here to create all things and to purify darkness, but understands that darkness is a part of creation. And the, through the creative process, darkness uh, is repurposed. And anything with purpose has a truth. It has a, it has a, uh, there's beauty that comes from it. There's beauty that comes from death. Beauty that, that comes from mushrooms, from fertilizer. Um, it's a part of the creative process. And there's a, there's a beauty in it and a beauty that can be harnessed through it. And the beauty harnessed through it, through the process of suffering and grief and ego death, is what comes about when a person has uh, learned to not obey their shadow but to understand their shadow, understand the darkness. They don't judge it anymore. They don't stand in judgment of people who are less than or people who have an opposing point of view. They don't, you know, you ever seen somebody who life has just humbled them? Really just humbled them. Like they've just been through so much that all they really want is to see everybody happy. It's those people who've been scrubbed clean by their tears, by their grief, by their pain, by their suffering, that God considers worthy. That God considers vessels for mercy. Not vessels for mercy, but to be, they're worthy of mercy because they have mercy in them. They resonate with mercy. They don't practice mercy. They don't observe mercy through, you know, commandments. They don't get up every morning and practice their daily dose of mercy or daily dose of charity. They're charitable. They're merciful because they understand what it's like to be downtrodden, broken. And it's those people who've experienced that pain who've been changed. And the vibration that they hold in them, the change that they hold in them, is the change that they will attract to them or the universe is ready to rebalance the scales to give back to people what they deserve spiritually because of their treasures stored in heaven. You know, they're not so concerned with the material world that they've amassed an empire for themselves. They're concerned with the internal world where they've amassed an empire for humanity. They have the potential 
to cure all of the sicknesses and the diseases of the world because it's within them. That if they were given the power, they would do it. You have some that if they were given the power to cure all the sicknesses and diseases of the world, they'd market it. Those people aren't worthy of the power. But you have some people who have the who, if they were given the power, they would cure every disease. They would heal the sick, the blind, the lame. Everyone would be walking. Everyone would be rich. Everyone would be powerful. Those are God's chosen people. It's not people who observe dead scriptures, dead words, who need to make sure they are outwardly demonstrating the characteristics of God that don't really exist in them and fly away when they become enraged or when they're presented with an opportunity, they get compromised very easily. They really haven't been tested. I'm going to go ahead and kill it here and um, move into the third part. So I have a third video coming shortly.